the Corova no bar sold no plus, which is what we were drinking. This would sharpen you up and make you ready for a bit of the old ultraviolence. I recently watched Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. This cinematic masterpiece is based on Anthony Burgess's 1962 novel, which paints a satirical and dystopian vision of near future. While I'll be discussing spoilers, it's a film that truly needs to be seen firsthand to be fully appreciated. And I think something that is most interesting about this story is our protagonist is clearly a villain. They're not a person with a tragic story, they are a monster, a malicious and terrible person. Now Kubrick found himself intrigued by the depth of Burgess's novel, and at its core, A Clockwork Orange is a vivid exploration of orchestrated aggression. It delves into these themes of individual autonomy, free will, and good versus evil. While these themes are frequently debated in relation to the story, I feel that a crucial element is often overlooked. There's an there's a underlying essence that many fail to consider. What gives Alex, the main protagonist, a propensity for the old ultraviolence. Kubrick's film seems to be a bold critique of psychological conditioning. Alex is a young delinquent, a hooligan, a hooligan with a drive and desire for uh, classical music and ultraviolence. His eventual capture leads him to prison where after two years, he appears reformed. Eager for an early release, Alex volunteers for an experimental uh, procedure promising to rid him of his violent tendencies. However, the outcome leaves him as nothing more than a hollow shell, um, devoid of any genuine emotion or will. So the behavioral conditioning though, that he undergoes doesn't truly reform him. It merely incapacitates him from acting on his violent impulses. It's only after a near fatal act that Alex breaks free from his induced state, returning to his pre-operation drives. Although his propensity for ultraviolence remains ambiguous. It should be noted how society chooses to treat Alex after he is released though. In some sense, they still see him as the same problematic and violent individual, so they treat him as such. They do not treat him as reformed after. They see the results of the technique as an opportunity to institute their own form of justice and morality. Even the government that pushed for the technique doesn't truly care about the results. They care about how the public perceives it. Now, Kubrick's interpretation of the novel includes a world with many unique characters where everyone feels untrustworthy, uh, surreal, and a little bit off. Alex is also our narrator and seems unbothered by the mysterious, surreal aesthetics around him. All of this makes for an unforgettable viewing experience. It makes you feel unsettled and unsure about everything you're seeing on screen. And the film's dark humor is evident in scenes where Alex and his droogs nonchalantly commit heinous acts or casually lounge in a milk bar. Um, this twisted world seems to mirror Alex's disturbed psyche. Now, I think something that is so thought-provoking about Alex as a protagonist is we rarely follow a villain or monster-like character that doesn't have some tragic backstory he you know he's not a product of a single bad circumstance he is a product of a society full of many influences and drives that influence alex so we as the viewer are forced to evaluate and pick one or some and that probably says a lot about our own bias based on how we view alex so i guess keep that in mind during my next points i'm bi i'm a bias watcher as well just like you are right now let's take a step back for a moment the name a clockwork orange burgess's title juxtaposes the organic and lively represented by orange with the mechanical and disciplined represented by clockwork he even described the title as a metaphor for you know something organic and full of life being you know transformed into a mechanism and that's kind of what alex represents the film and the book both suggest the idea that when a person loses their free will they become merely a mechanical object like a clockwork orange i want to focus on this idea of conditioning for a moment though and raise the question if we ever really have free will 
You know, Alex clearly loves violence. It's what he's good at. He embodies this violence. He's almost like a symbol of it. He, in some sense, is a sim is the symbol of it for us as a viewer. Now, we should consider how societal frameworks, values, language, and symbols uh, collectively contribute to an apparatus that promotes uh, conformity, making us more predictable. Now, I'm not passing a moral judgment on this. It's merely an observation. This is what society aims to do in general. It aims to make us predictable. So the society of a clockwork orange wishes to make Alex more predictable in some sense. However, this is the tension the film and Kubrick play with, the tension between societal order and individual freedom. While conditioning might offer a solution to societal problems, it comes at the cost of individual freedom and the further potentiality of various human experiences and, and expressions of that human experience. Yet we, as the viewer, we see Alex, he is a monster. If he wishes to be in society, he needs to change, right? Now, in the film, the Levitico technique worked for, for some time. The efficacy of the method is showcased to a select group of, let's say, powerful individuals. They observe Alex as he, you know, falls to his knees in front of a man who strikes him and he subsequently shows a submissive demeanor towards a young naked woman. Uh, while Alex's spiritual advisor from prison criticizes the government for depriving Alex of his autonomy, the state representatives present are satisfied with the outcome. Consequently, Alex is granted his freedom from incarceration after this procedure. Now, on the one hand, I see the commentary on how we as a society should evaluate what leads individuals such as Alex toward a life of violence. We should look at the societal pressures that cause this. However, the film seems to push the message that Alex, in many regards, has an inherent drive towards evil. In this case, I do wonder if the Ludvidico technique actually worked permanent. What if it had prevented him from being able to act on his violent impulses permanently? The problem is the technique isn't really rehabilitation. It's a torture technique. It doesn't guide an individual. It imposes on an individual. And we as a viewer intuitively see an inherent issue with this method of solving an issue with an individual, rightly so. So the state aims to free society from the menace of violent individuals like Alex. This freedom results in the coercion of the individual, stripping him of his authentic desires and emotions. I suppose I'm intrigued by this idea of authentic drives and desires. The portrayal of Alex, driven by his violent tendencies, is presented as his true and innate drives and desires. However, one has to ponder, is Alex's initial life of ultraviolence a result of unrestrained freedom? While we, as viewers, perceive Alex to be free before his procedure, he is, in reality, bound by his own drives and desires for violence. These desires and drives are not solely his own creation as well. They are influenced and shaped by the societal structures around him. At least, at least to some extent, we have to at least say that. I think we need to remember, although he doesn't look it, he is technically a teenage boy in the film. He's only supposed to be like 15. So I suppose I'm putting forward that Alex never had free will. And let me try to sum this up though. On one hand, the narrative of A Clockwork Orange prompts us to question the societal conditions that breed individuals like Alex. Is it poverty, lack of education, broken family structures, or the media that glorifies violence? Or is it something truly innate and always part of Alex? Or perhaps it's the very fabric of a dystopian society that fails to provide its youth with meaningful avenues for self-expression and growth. The environment in which Alex thrives is one of decay, both moral and societal. This backdrop serves as a kind of silent commentary on the failures of institutions meant to nurture and guide us. So maybe we should wonder, why Alex was able to thrive in this society for a time. However, juxtaposed against the societal backdrop is Alex's seemingly inherent drive towards ultraviolence. His acts, especially the heinous act of rape, are executed without a hint of remorse. This raises the ethical dilemma. If there exists a technique like the Levitico 
procedure that can effectively curb such a violent tendency should it be employed? I think the film and, and story assume the answer is more clear than what our reality and understanding of the psyche actually suggests. It assumes free will, essentially. And I suppose we take issue with the torture aspect of the technique, and rightly so. You know, I'm a believer that violence breeds more violence. But the psychological reprogramming aspect is something that we employ as a society, be it unconsciously or consciously. If you take away the aspect of torture and simply, you know, depict a reprogramming or reprogrammed individual that no longer has a drive for violence, our potential support for a state sanctioned program might begin to change. For example, the story assumes free will to be true in many regards. If our desires, drives, and actions are influenced by external factors, to what extent do we truly exercise free will? Is free will an illusion, a construct that we cling to, believing we are making you know, independent choices when in reality, we are products of our environment? You know, environment, upbringing, and societal pressures. So Alex's ultraviolence can be seen as an extreme manifestation of societal failures. I suppose my answer to all of this is I don't know in many regards. Uh, however, the film and story truly prompted me to introspect and question my own understanding of freedom and free will and choice and responsibility and consequently the role society and the state plays in formulating that understanding and its role in formulating our drives and desires. If you enjoyed this video, please uh, hit that subscribe button, hit that little bell button, and uh, tune in next time. But it's time for you to get out of my labyrinth.